Chapter 3 Heat There are two ball fields in Macomb Dam Park, a real green grass park in the Bronx. The regulation diamond, one with big league dimensions used by Babe Ruth's team and the American League team and even some high schools, was tucked in the corner of the park where 161st Street intersected with Rupert Place. The Little League field was one closer to the major Deegan Expressway. During the regular Little League season, Michael's first in America, his team was sponsored by the big New York sports sporting goods store Medals. They called themselves the Medal Monuments after the monuments inside the stadium and played its home game here. Now in the summer, the Clippers also played their home games at Macomb when they weren't pitching of the Bronx All-Star teams up in Riverdale and at Castle Hill Field and at Crotona Park, maybe a mile away by car from the Gerard Avenue. Sometimes they would play games as far as the White Plains in New Rochelle because there were even all-star teams from Southwest Chester County in the district, District 22. On summer days, the kind that seemed to have no clock on them except for the setting sun, kind you never wanted to end. Michael and his friends usually had the Macomb Dam Park Field to themselves if they could get up enough guys for a pickup game. Even if they couldn't come up with two full teams, they would invent games, depending on how many players they had. On days like this, baseball would make Michael as happy as it ever did. No umpires, no coaches, no rules except the ones you made up. Just play. And what felt to Michael like his own personal playground. Other times, they would join the older kids on the regulation field, though Michael would never pitch in those games from the mound 60 feet from home plate because Carlos had forbidden that. So had Mr. Minya. You can move back from the plate when you move up to the 13 rounds next season, Mr. Minya had said. The only other player from the Monuments who had made the Clippers, the South Bronx All-Star team, that would eventually try to qualify as a representative of the Eastern States to go to the Williamsport for the World Series was his catcher, Manny. Manny was waiting now, along with two other guys from the Clippers, Kelvin Carter and Anthony Fierro, on the backfield where Michael showed up. It was still only 2 o'clock, two hours from when El Grande would pitch against the Red Sox, but already you could see more traffic getting off the Deegan above them, see the whole area around the stadium coming to life, as if it always did on game day. Manny smiled when he saw Michael. Nothing unusual about that. Manny Cabrera always seemed to be smiling, except when he would strike out with the bases loaded, and when he would fail to throw out a runner trying to steal second base. He was almost a head shorter than Michael, 20 pounds heavier at least, and was the best catcher in all of District 22. Some of the players on the other team would occasionally call him No Chuck, No Neck Cabrera, mostly because he didn't have one. Usually they did this when they thought he couldn't hear them, but even when he did, he still had that smile on his face, as if he and the world were in on the same joke. Here comes a superhero now, Manny said as Michael walked across the infield. Whoa, 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 Kelvin said, pumping his fist. Which X-Men is he? I forgot. Anthony Ferrero said. Wish he was that. Fine ex-girl Haley Berry, Berry, Kel said. Then Kel, whoa, whoa, whoa again. It seemed to be more for Haley Berry than this time than Michael. Do not stop, Michael said. Oh, listen to that starting pitcher telling us not to stop, Manny said. Like a community playing to a crowd of three. Maybe he is afraid we'll reveal his secret identity. Kelvin Carter was the Clippers' shortstop. His father worked on the ground crew at Yankee Stadium, which meant he was one of the guys who did the little dance routine to the song YMCA when it was time to rake the infield dirt in the fifth inning. Kelvin said, Do you catch his criminals by day? Does his bad little league thing by night? Better not let Coach find out you threw it from home plate to dead center, Manny said. Who said I did? Michael said. I think I heard it from Katie Kerr, Manny said. No, Kel said. It had to be Oprah. I definitely heard about it from Dan Patrick on the Sports Center, Anthony said. Shut up, Michael said, unable to keep a smile down. All of you. I can't believe it wasn't on the front page of the Daily News, Anthony said. Michael knew there was no sense fighting them when they got going like this. The best thing to do was let them have their fun until they ran out of what they thought was a hysterical funny lines. Okay, we'll stop, Manny said eventually. But before we do, I have to ask you one question. 
He got up from the bench, put his catcher's mitt on, which meant he was ready to start getting Michael warmed up. Knock yourself out, Michael said. Manny looked at Calvin and Anthony, both of whom were already giggling. He said, When you're fighting crime, what color cape do you wear? Howls, Calvin said. Or do you hear those tights? Do you wear those tights like Spider-Man, the Daredevil, and them? Whoa, not Daredevil, Manny said. The girl in that movie, the one from Alias, she took out more bad guys than Ben Affleck did. Michael was throwing a ball high into the air straight up and catching it, sometimes behind his back, doing his best to ignore them. You know, he said finally, as if talking to the sky, maybe the real Daredevil would be the guy who has to lead off against me today. Everybody made a low, ooh, sound. In that case, Manny said, it's a good thing Cal begged to hit first today. Did not, Calvin said. Did too. Did not infinity, Cal said, as if slam dunking the word infinity. That's the only time I'd ever asked to hit against Arrow, by the way, on the 12th of infinity. I promise I won't throw hard, Michael said, heading for the mound as Manny got into his squat behind home plate. Calvin was still shaking his head as he watched the guys going out into the field, deserting him. Your half speed is faster than most guys, full speed, Arrow. So don't be giving me none of your I won't throw hard. He reluctantly went over to the screen behind the plate, where they all stacked their bats. Just don't be trying for the magic number today, he said. Eight zero, Manny said. The past couple of years, there had been more and more games from the Little League World Series on television, starting with the sectional qualifiers. Manny's family had cable so he would invite Michael over to their apartment to watch the games on ESPN and ESPN2. And they would talk about this year, the year when they were sure that they would make it far enough into the tournament to get on TV themselves. And all the games they had watched, and Manny watched a lot more than Manny did, or Michael did, there had never been a time when one of the pitcher's first balls had been measured at 80 miles per hour. They had seen Danny Almonte, the star pitcher from another Bronx team, the kid who got even more famous when they found out he was 14 instead of 12, the year he was pitching all those no-hitters, get to 75 miles an hour. Manny said he remembered someone he described as a big old boy from Kentucky, putting up what he called the double seven. But no one had ever hit 80. 80 was the magic number for Little League pitchers, the way 100 was the radar gun in the big leagues. Except Manny said, Hitting 80 at their age was really like the same as someone older hitting 110. That was his theory. Manny had theories about almost everything under the sun. Michael knew. Here was another. The Michael hit 80 all the time. Even if they didn't have TV cameras or radar guns covering the Medell monuments or the Clippers, Manny said that he didn't need no stinking gun for his Pudge Rodriguez mitt to know how fast Michael was throwing. Kel had his bright red bat and glove on but was still complaining about having to be the first to hit, making it sound as if they were sending him to detention or the principal's office. When he was finally done, he heard Manny call out to Michael. Let me give you a sign. Manny put down one finger, which meant fastball. Kyle whipped his head around. I saw that, he said. You told him to throw his number one, didn't you? Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't, Manny said. During the game, sometimes he would put down two fingers or three or even four. But that was just for fun, like a game he and Michael played with each other. Or if there was a runner on second base who had watched too much big league baseball on television and thought it mattered if you stole a sign and knew what pitch was coming. But Michael and Manny knew that Michael's dad had told him he wasn't allowed to throw any kind of curveball until he was in high school and it was bad for his arm. Not just his arm, but any arm. Poppy had always said, attached to a little league body, so Michael didn't even fool around with curves when he was fooling around with his buddies like this. Poppy had drilled the dangers of breaking balls into him from as far back as Michael could remember the way he had drilled English into him. Or the dangers of drugs. Or sometimes Michael would take something off his number one just, just as a way of setting a hitter up or getting him off balance. Proved it was one handful of hitters he'd run into whom actually get around on his fastball. Michael threw bait fastballs for six innings a week, which is all the innings Little League rules allowed him to pitch in one week. Mr. Minier could break up those six innings any way he wanted. Michael could pitch six in one game, three in two games, or four one day and two a couple days later. Just no more than six in a week of regular season. But this wasn't official pitching now. 
not against Manny and Cal and Anthony. This was just pure fun, from his first pitch, which he lobbed up there to Cal, who looked shocked as he put his bat on the ball and hit one in the air to where Anthony was standing in short center field. Michael wanted Cal to hit a few balls to Anthony, just so Anthony would stop complaining about not having any balls to shot. I should have brought my homework, Anthony had said when he first got into the outfield, refusing to move more than 10 yards back from the base. You don't do homework, Manny reminded him. Well, if I did, Anthony said, this would be the perfect time to catch up on it. After a few lob balls, Cal said, okay, I don't want any of your pity. Go ahead and gun it. Michael made a show of rubbing up the old ball they were using. First, you don't want to hit because you say I throw too hard. Now you say I'm throwing too easy. You're giving me, Manny, what's he giving me here? You're the one with the words. A mixed message. Exactly, Michael said. You're giving me a mixed message. Cal, smiling at him, made a show like he was about to give Michael an upraised middle finger. I'd like to give you something more than that, Cal said. Hey, Michael said. There could be kids watching. I thought we were kids, Manny said. Nah, Cal said. We're much cooler than that. We are so cool, Manny said. Cooler than LL Cool J, Cal said. Anthony, who had the deepest voice of all of them, had come into the infield. Now he made his voice even deeper, trying to make himself sound like a TV announcer. Hey, he said. Oh, you South Bronx Clippers, where are you going as soon as you kick a little more butt? Disney World, Cal said. Anthony made a sound like a game show buzzer that meant wrong answer. Where are we going, he asked again. In one voice, Anthony included, they, call, they yelled, Williamsport. Anthony ran back to the center. Then he got back into his squat. Then Michael threw a real number one to Cal that he missed by a mile. As if he was swimming, as if he were swinging at the sound of the ball going past him, not at anything he saw. That wasn't the best part of the pitch. The best part of the pitch was that Michael's best buddy, Manny, who thought he was used to Michael's heat, who bragged on being the only guy in the District 22 who could even think about handling Michael's heat, got knocked back so hard that the force of the pitch that he ended up sitting down. Michael started in from the mound. Are you okay, he said. Fine, Manny said. He just sat there as if nothing had happened, perfectly relaxed, staring at the ball in his glove. Absolutely fine, he said. Then he popped to his feet. Manny was agile for someone with a body shape like a fire hydrant. Only Michael, of all his friends and teammates, knew about the dance classes he took. The ones he even admitted to Michael he liked, because they were a way for him to show off how light on his feet not just a lump behind the plate. The guy who stayed in one place so much of the baseball game loved to move, Michael knew. He brought the ball out of the mound himself, handed it to Michael, and said, 80. Michael looked around. Did I miss the guy with the jug gun? It was one of the first radar guns he'd ever heard them talking about on the radio. I told you, man, he said. I don't need no stinking gun. He put his pudge mitt down between him and Michael. I got this, he said. This never lies. He yelled at Anthony Fierro to come in and hit if he wanted, then walked back to the plate. 80, Michael heard him say. Some other ball players from the neighborhood, Babe Ruth League kids, showed up just as Michael and Manny and Anthony and Cal were about to pack it up and go to McDonald's. Then some older kids who had been shooting baskets on one of the courts over the, near the stadium asked if they could play. They made it 13 plays in all, enough to have a game. Three infielders, two outfielders, a pitcher. Manny had offered to be a full-time catcher, saying he didn't need to hit. He'd already conquered hitting. Michael played center field, saying he might throw a couple of pitches at the end, just for fun. But he loved playing center field. Loved getting a chance to run across the outfield to pretend it was in inside the stadium. Michael loved to move, basically. So they played their pickup game, trash talking each other, laughing, barely keeping track of the score, everybody trying their hardest to smoke balls past the two outfielders, or in this case, the bigger kids from the basketball court, trying to jack balls over their heads. When they were waiting to hit, they could look past the batter's box toward Yankee Stadium and see the baseball afternoon coming to life now, gathering forest like one of the late afternoon storms you got into the summer. Occasionally, they would hit. They would hear the cheers from the fans line up behind the blue police barriers on both sides of the players' entrance to the stadium as the players walked out of the parking lot on the Negan side, Rupert. Michael was able to picture 
it in his head because of all the times he had come and stood behind those blue barriers himself, hoping to get a look at El Grande, even four hours before the game time, knowing El Grande liked to get to the puck early when it was his turn to pitch. So Michael was fairly certain that El Grande Gonzalez was already inside the Yankee clubhouse by the time the Clippers and the rest of the kids on the far field of McCombs were playing their pickup game. When they had agreed that the stop would be would be five innings. It turned out four basketball guys had bleacher tickets to today's game, which they proudly showed off to Michael and Manny, bragging, pulling the tickets out of their pockets of their baggy gym shorts. Shorts that went way past their knees, as if they were pulling out pieces of gold. But in the meantime, they had their own game to play. It was the top of the fourth inning that Michael noticed the beautiful girl watching them through the fence at the basketball court. Michael was 12 and a boy and a ball player and usually showed no interest in girls because he knew his friends would act as if he had broken some kind of law. But even Michael Arrow could see this was an uncommonly beautiful girl with the long dark hair, dark skin, and big dark eyes that somehow, even from a distance, looked sad to him. The girl had a baseball glove under her arm. Maybe she's sad, he thought to himself, because we haven't asked her to play. The girl was still watching through the fence when it was Michael's turn to pitch the top of the fifth. For some reason, he looked over at her after the first pitch to the tallest of the basketball players, the one whose name was Eric Scapetta, whose nickname was Escope. Escope was a banger. He had already proved that when Cal had pitched to him, hitting a bomb to the place in dead center where there was a hole in the fence, the one that the purse thief had been running toward before Michael took him down with a bomb of his own. Now Michael went into his full windup, his El Grande windup, leg high, his ball in his head tucked briefly behind his glove before he threw the fast ball past Eastcope that made the older boy not only miss, but put very colorful swear words together in a way Michael had never heard before, not even living in the Bronx, where you could walk past an open window in the summer and feel as if you discovered the capital of swearing. Michael ignored him, looked back toward the fence, wanting to see if the pretty girl was still watching, if she'd seen him pour his fastball in that way. She was watching, and no longer looked sad. She had her arms folded in front of her, the glove pressed against her chest, and Michael was sure she was laughing at him. As if she had been waiting for him to look back over so she could see him laughing at him. It was almost as if she knew in the way that girls always seemed to know things that boys didn't, that he wouldn't be able to help himself, that he needed to see what her reaction would be. But what the heck was so funny? Michael struck out Eastcope on three pitches, struck out the next two guys, not even throwing his hardest, dragged to the bench, and put his glove down. He made the last out of the inning before, so it would be a while before he hit, if he hit at all, since this was his team's last up. He told Manny he'd be right back and started walking toward the basketball courts, not walking toward the girl at first, walking with his hands in his pockets, heads down, as if he were on his way to a small brick administration building at Macomb Dam Park, up at the corner of 161st Street in Rupert. But when he got about 20 yards away, he turned and started walking toward her, smiling at her now, calling out to her. Hey, he said, what was so funny before? And that's when she ran. She was wearing a white t-shirt and blue jeans and had legs almost as long as Michael's tall, pretty girl with those eyes. She ran pa- She ran fast for a girl, for anybody up the hill toward Yankee Stadium, her glove under her arm until she disappeared into the crowd of people coming around the corner from the subway station. And those who had their own tickets like gold in their pockets to watch El Grande high kick his fastball into gear against the Red Sox. Gone.